Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, for being with us. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to have you at ECTEL this afternoon. The floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos, for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think we just talked about somebody who lived uh, 5,300 years ago. So we're going to switch over and talk about uh, the next 10 years. Uh, as uh, Carlos said, I did grow up in Israel, so I'm kind of used to things that were 5,300 years ago. Uh, but I grew up in the desert, so it was kind of funny when he was talking about uh, rivers and about icebergs. That's pretty foreign to me. So first of all, a piece of good news. Uh, Carlos gave me an hour, but I'm going to try to keep it to half of that. I know I'm on the last session and between you and dinner. So I'll keep it uh, relatively brief, but uh, like Carlos said, it's early here. So I got all the time for a Q&A and also I'm Israeli. So please don't uh, hesitate to interrupt me. I mean, that's what we call in Israel, having a conversation. If you have a question, just ask it. I'm happy to answer it or hear any comments on the fly. Uh, so but basically my talk is going to consist of a few parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the world we're living in right now which obviously is quite different than the world of uh, two years ago. Uh, the second uh, topic is going to be why we believe that virtual classrooms in many ways have uh, very significant benefits. And then I'll get into more specifics on how using correctly the right technologies and the right pedagogies, you can get better outcomes for students. And then I'll switch over to a little bit of uh, future, which is to talk about data collection, analysis. Um, I'll, I'll touch a bit on multimodality instruction and then talk about how, by collecting a lot of data, you could harness the power of things like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to bring education to the next level. So we all know what happened in uh, 2020. Uh, most of the European universities did switch over to distance learning. Again, it was kind of an emergency thing. And candidly, that move is what precipitated um, a few of us to start Engagely. Uh, the company was started primarily by two former Stanford professors and myself. Uh, one of the things uh, that I did in the past decade was be part of the early days of uh, Coursera. Coursera was founded by my wife, uh, Daphne Kohler, and I was on the board of Coursera from its inception until Daphne and I left uh, the board of Coursera uh, a few years ago. And we thought that that is the end of our involvement for a while in technology and higher ed. Uh, Daphne went on to raise hundreds of millions of dollars for a company using machine learning for drug discovery. And then we saw our two girls, uh, one is now a student in Berkeley and the other is finishing high school, thrust into Zoom school. And we were candidly uh, displeased with the results because we saw all engagement go out the window. Uh, it took our daughters about an hour to figure out how to exploit the fact that they were not in the same room with the teacher and do whatever they wanted as opposed to study. And so we, we just thought that engagement has to be a core part of distance learning. It, the Coursera students tend to be a bit different than the type of students that are uh, using Engagely, they tend to be later in their career, they tend to be more about adding specific skills, usually tied to uh, the fact that it uh, gives them more job opportunities. And so they tend to be more motivated than, um, and more mature than somebody earlier in their life. And that's what precipitated the beginning of this company. Uh, my co-founder, Serge, was also like Daphne, a tenured professor at uh, Stanford, between them they taught about 50 years at Stanford. And he too had a lot of ideas of what's needed to improve and move forward. So this trend that we are seeing um, in basically life-changing post-pandemic is in many parts of the economy. I'll give uh, two examples beyond the one in the slide. Uh, telemedicine for many, many, many years was kind of stuck. And now, at least in the US, telemedicine has become the norm for most people. Instead of coming to a doctor, 
the doctor comes to you via video conference. And the second is grocery shopping. Uh, there were attempts in the early 2000s to do home delivery of groceries and it kind of stalled uh, very early on in kind of 2001 when the dot-com crash happened. And then Instacart, as you know, DoorDash and the like uh, had a huge resurgence and most people are now doing some or all of their shopping uh, online. And the same as employees. So this study was done by Robert Half. Uh, Robert Half is a well-known headhunting uh, company here in the States. And as you could see, about three quarters of people prefer to at least part of their time work out of their house. And in fact, the full third are thinking of changing jobs if they have to go back at all to an office. And the same statistics, interestingly enough, are also tracking for students. And uh, again, about three quarters of the students want to take some of their courses online. So even though we started the company or launched the company less than a year ago, at this point, our product has been used in all continents except Antarctica. And I definitely have to say that it's become much more broadly accepted, this whole concept of distance or virtual learning. And, you know, people are sometimes people talking, well, you know, we're going back to normal. Well, I, I don't think that this necessarily is what people want to go back to. And so when most people think about virtual uh, learning, uh, the first uh, thing that uh, jumps to their mind is something that looks like this, uh, a bunch of uh, cameras turned off and we're being nice. So you could see over here that we have all kinds of excuses why the cameras are turned off, low bandwidth, a bad hair day, and so on. Candidly, the reason why most people turn off the cameras is because they're doing something else. Uh, I can tell you that <laughs> I've sat through many, many uh, conference calls where my camera was turned off and I was very busy doing something that had nothing to do with the topic of the conference call. And so you know, we really need to have people more engaged. Otherwise, they're not going to get a whole lot out of sitting in a Zoom call. And we're hearing this consistently from professors and students uh, throughout the world. And uh, so topics keep coming up, how to get students engaged and actively learning. Um, again, there's many, and this was uh, even more put under the spotlight with the tragedy of George Floyd about equity and diversity and inclusion. How do we make sure that people, no matter what computer they have or how good their bandwidth is or what their environment is, can get the full benefit of remote teaching? Uh, managing a class remotely can be challenging if you don't have the right tool. And lastly, Community is super important, I'll touch on that. And when we set out to develop Engagely, uh, which by the way is developed from the ground up, it's not built on top of Zoom or Teams or Google Meet, it's built from scratch. These were the issues we wanted to address and give a solution to. And so again, these are the four pillars of what we think is crucial towards making virtual classrooms, in many cases, even better than a physical classroom for certain cases. And I very much like what Rector Romo of University of Carlos III in Madrid said, which is there's no back row in a digital classroom. Everybody's a first class citizen. Uh, so initially, universities got thrust into this, uh, basically going from every student is in person to no student is in person. Uh, they were not happy about it. Students were not happy about it. And after a while, people started realizing that there's actual real benefits in this. First of all, you could start uh, teaching people globally. We just ran a or ESMT in Germany just ran a class on our platform to African students. Uh, many of the US universities we work with, as well as European universities we work with, have students in Asia. Suddenly, people don't have to commute. I mean, if you look at the fastest growing universities in the US, ASU, Western Governors, 
and uh, so on. They're all basically attracting students from the entire country. And uh, th there's no reason not to. Uh, we, we do believe that uh, the actual virtual classroom is inclusive and brings again people that maybe had no opportunity to enter a classroom before. Um, I don't know if any of you have visited the headquarters of Coursera, but the headquarters of Coursera is full with uh, letters written on the walls from students from throughout the world, thank you letters, uh, for basically having an opportunity to learn. Uh, Daphne would get literally daily emails of students who explained that because they could take a course on Coursera, these were people from all over the world, uh, suddenly they had the opportunity to get a better job or they could open their mind to new ideas. Uh, this is what you can do when you don't have to physically drive to a classroom. Um, and I'll talk a lot about what data driven means. It does create opportunity for improved instruction. And then lastly, uh, Daphne always talks about kind of the three pillars of what it takes to really make education successful. So there's quality, there is scale, and there is cost. Obviously, you want to drive up as much as possible the quality and the scale while driving down cost. And this is something that we believe can be done using the virtual classroom. So uh, most people learn not just being talked at, but by actually being involved and learning. And that, by the way, is, uh, um, in my opinion, one of the most important things about our platform that used correctly, it drives active learning. And I'll give you a small anecdote from my uh, distant past, not as distant as the Iceman, but quite distant. Uh, my first year of uh, college, I had to study drafting because I was an engineering uh, major. And I did my first year of uh, college studies in a small community college, uh, very close to Apple headquarters. And because I studied drafting in high school, they put me in the advanced class, which I had absolutely no reason to be in because I was terrible at drafting in high school. And the class I was in, most of the people there were employees from Bay Area companies like Hewlett Packard, Apple, and so on, that basically had 15 years of experience drafting. And I was a 17-year-old who could barely hold a pencil. And this was way before CAD CAM. This was literally little triangles and pens. And uh, sorry, not pens, little pencils. And I was terrible at it. But again, I'll get to the community aspects of that too. Because a teacher and all the students kept helping me, I somehow managed uh, by the skin of my teeth to pass this CAD class, not with a particularly good grade, but I passed it. And it gave me skills for the rest of my life. I mean, over the years, I've been involved in a lot of hardware development. And uh, because I had to do all these drawings, I can easily read a mechanical drawing and I can easily do a little sketch to explain a concept. And candidly, if I wasn't actively doing it, if all I did was sit and look at slides of the professor showing how to draw something, uh, I wouldn't have gotten anything out of it. And I talked about the collaborative aspects of this. Uh, the fact that they had these professional drafts people who would show up and show me little tricks that they developed over the 15 years of experience they had, again, allowed me to complete this course. And lastly, we do believe that the role of the professor is key. The only reason I stuck it out in this class was because I really liked the professor. And he taught me a lot of life skills at the same time that he was teaching me how to uh, basically put pencil to paper. Now, there's a lot of studies. I'm sure you know them much better than I do. This is one study that showed that the more good activities uh, students do, the more um, help they get from their instructors, the better learning outcomes. It kind of seems self-evident, but there's a lot of scholarly studies that demonstrate this to be a fact. 
Uh, just again, one little personal anecdote. <laughs> my daughter came to me, my, who was now finishing high school, very proudly saying that she got to work in the workshop in her school and she drilled a hole uh, for a physics research project. And now she basically feels much more connected to this whole topic of building experimental apparatus. Again, if somebody gave her that experimental apparatus with a hole drilled into it, she wouldn't have felt this ownership of this project. So this is just a little example of how we can dry, help professors drive this within Engagely. Uh, this is what, uh, on the bottom left, a quiz looks like in Engagely. What I'm not showing here is all the professor has to do is put a slide into whatever presentation deck they're using. It can be PowerPoint, can be Keynote, can be Google Slides, it doesn't matter. They put a little marker that we give them, which is just a little image that you paste wherever you want these round circles to be. And these are clickable buttons automatically that are generated on the student screen. So again, the instructor does not need to learn a new system for courseware. All they have to do is literally take whatever deck they have or whatever presentation software they have and paste these very simple little square images. And automatically the students get presented to them a quiz or a poll. And because it's integrated with the rest of the platform, um, you, I'll show in a bit what you could do, but you can demo, show the students the results and later use those results to automatically divide the students into learning pods that are based on people having same or different points of view on a given topic. So one of the early drivers of collaborative learning is Professor Eric Mazur, who is a physics professor in um, Harvard. He has great uh, YouTube videos if uh, you care to watch him. And he basically says that in most of universities, most of the classrooms are like this. They basically look like a movie theater or like a theater. And the professor sits on the stage, does all the work, and the students sit in the back and take in information. And I don't know if you saw this video, but what he shows in this video is there is a, a concept in physics that he said he was struggling time and time again to explain to his uh, students at Harvard. And it was always a struggle to get him to explain it. One year, he decided to do an experiment and he told the students to explain it to each other. And he basically stopped talking and let the students interact with each other and explain to each other the concept. And said after a few minutes, I said, okay, we got it, let's move on. I can tell you that in some very complicated algorithms classes I took, uh, it was basically not the professor explained clearly to me the algorithm, but one of my peers that I quietly asked, hey, you know, what's the professor talking about? That was explained to me and I got it. And again, the typical classroom is not really designed for it, which is the point he makes. So what he's recommending is, in fact, that to create active learning, you need to somewhat reorganize the classroom into tables where students can interact with each other. Um, and that's exactly what we promote in Engagely. We create these tables and the students at an engaged table, which is a virtual table, are at all times able to communicate with each other. Now, many professors are put off by the idea that a student can talk to another student while the professor is lecturing. So to address this issue, we put a mute button that turns off this ability for students to talk to each other while the professor is talking. Candidly, I don't particularly recommend doing it. I can tell from just observing students and my daughters uh, they'll find a way around it. I mean, today everybody has, in addition to the computer, a cell phone and a tablet and all that. And we actually came up with this idea because I saw how my daughters study. And while the professor or their teacher thought that they were looking at the professor or teacher, they were talking to their friends on FaceTime. Uh, the professor did not see the little iPhone on the side of the screen. And so there's an old American expression that if you can't beat them, join them. So you might as well join them. And we measure the talk time. And that shows you who's active, and that, those are what these little green dots mean. It's all, by the way, you, useful for learning who is more of a leader in the class, which you can use for other purposes as well. Another thing we do, uh, again, to create this ability of collaboration 
is the ability to distribute at the press of a button the distribution of documents for these table groups to work on. And one of the many reasons why we integrated everything into the one platform was actually because my younger daughter, uh, who at this point, like all kids her age, an expert in distance learning, uh, she said that she hated the fact that when she was taking a class at school on Zoom, then, you know, when there was a quiz, I had to go to Kahoot, and then I had to go to a different tab for Canvas, and another tab for Google Docs. And I mean, you're talking about a kid who was born and raised in Silicon Valley. She's definitely very comfortable with computers, but even she did not like jumping around tabs all the time, and it's a headache for the student, it's a headache for the instructor. So we drive everything that the student is looking at into one place, so they don't have to use a variety of different applications. Um, and another thing we talked about is this whole thing about reducing the cognitive load on the instructor. I'm totally impressed by professors today who are teaching and while they're teaching, they see this endless stream of uh, chat messages and they don't know which one has to do with what. Um, so we simply, if you look at the below the face of the professor, we separate out the chat and the Q&A. The q and is designed to be a discussion board, a la Coursera discussion board or any of the other discussion boards. It's threaded, students can vote up and down the importance of questions. So it makes it much easier for the professor to focus on what's right, uh, sorry, what's important for the group. And you can see highlighted in red, uh, this is a feature we've not implemented yet. We do try to alert students to take certain actions, like if you can see where it says the notes, um, students can automatically in our system grab screenshots, write on the screenshot and save it to a file. It alerts a student to do something, especially if the student is not doing anything, again, as a way to draw students to be more actively engaged in the classroom. Something that candidly we did not anticipate, uh, but uh, turned out in one of our very first trials, which we did in the University of California in San Diego, is uh, the professor who taught this class noticed that the shy students were much more comfortable asking their fellow students questions than they were raising their hand and addressing the professor. And so this prevents students from being left behind because if you have a very shy student who might not understand the concept that's early on in the class, they will be lost for the rest of the session. This allows these uh, students to quickly catch back up to where the class is and not be left behind. And I'll show a study done by Stanford many years ago that speaks to this very point. Um, and so we talked about the whole issue of peer-to-peer -peer instruction. Uh, Robert Heinlein has this quote that he never learned from a man who agreed with me. I have to say that he was not who invented this. Uh, this was invented many, many, many generations before by Socrates and many other ways of uh, people arguing with our learning, but it's no doubt effective. And again, one of the things that we're building into our platform is an opportunity to give the instructor to automatically subdivide the class into these groups based on people's disagreements. Or by the way, if you want that to have tables of people that agree with each other, uh, you can do that as well. And this is what we show over here. You basically ask a question, you get different points of view on this question, and automatically the group is divided to people who've answered different answers to the question. Uh, Jim Gibbons is uh, one of the forefathers of using the technology in the classroom. Uh, when Daphne and Serge were professors at Stanford, he was a Dean of Engineering. Uh, he's a professor of electrical engineering. Uh, and back in the 70s, he started experimenting with the use of technology in a uh, classroom. And by the way, a company I ran in the 90s actually used uh, some of uh, Dean Gibbons' work. And I was just interviewing a candidate uh, two days ago who took one of uh, Serge's, my colleagues, uh, courses at Stanford, also using this uh, Stanford remote uh, instruction, again, back in the 90s. So again, please remember, no internet, long time ago. And so 
what Professor Gibbons did was he compared, but, but by the way, not as far goes Iceman, I admit. Um, and I promise this is the last Iceman joke. So um, what he did was compare four different cohorts of students. The first cohort were the ones in his classroom at Stanford. And again, I want to draw your attention, this is super important, to the number of students in the class, 302 students. And this was in the 70s. Uh, the machine learning course that Daphne used to teach is today over a thousand every time they run it in the classroom. And Stanford is not a big school. I asked my daughter in Berkeley, her smallest class is 100, and it easily gets to over a thousand. And this is not a great experience for anybody. This is another example of what the rector of UC3M said there is no back row in a virtual classroom. We really believe in this big classrooms. The virtual classroom has more to offer than these huge rooms in, on campus. But anyway, so he bet these are admitted on campus Stanford students, and uh, they scored a 3.7 um, grade point average, roughly. Uh, sorry, not 3.7, uh, 3.37 grade point average. Uh, by the way, there's a reminder in the American system, it's out of four. Uh, so please don't be too horrified, it's not out of 10. Uh, and then uh, he had uh, 55 students who took his class, like employees in my company. What Stanford did, again, back in those days, were they used, point, they used microwave dishes to beam over their classes to companies who were willing to pay Stanford to educate their students. It became very, very popular, by the way, in the 90s. It was a benefit to employees. And as I'm sure you know, uh, in Silicon Valley, there's huge competition for engineers and you also want your engineers to be all the time upskilled. And so all companies, including the one I ran in the 90s were more than happy to pay a huge amount of money to Stanford to continue educating their employees. So these people that saw the class live and could phone in literally through a phone line with a question, they did uh, not score as well as the Stanford students. Uh, the next uh, from um, third from the left is where it says video no tutor. What they did over there was, again, this was before the internet. They literally shipped to these specific individuals VCR cassettes with a recording of the class. And they could watch it at their leisure. It's kind of like today video on demand. You can see they did the poorest of the group. What's most surprising, and to me most important, is a group on the far right. These were employees of Hewlett Packard in a facility that Hewlett Packard has north of uh, San Francisco, that along with the video cassette, Stanford shipped out a student who took that course the previous semester or quarter in the case of Stanford. And what this uh, student did was simply play the video for a few minutes and then stop it. And then there would be a little discussion between all the people who were viewing it about what they just saw. And if anybody had a question, their peers could answer it. You could see that these students did far better than the in-class Stanford students, even though they were not Stanford students and not necessarily been admitted to Stanford. And so this shows you the power of peer-to-peer -peer instruction and the ability for people to collaborate. So we've recreated this without the need to ship anybody VCR cassettes and without the need of people to be physically in the same place. Uh, we came up with that concept last summer uh, and we have it working now. Between these two times, Disney has came up with it and their streaming service, they call it the watch party. I've seen my daughter you, I do an informal version of a watch party where she watches with her friends uh, movies. And uh, the way it works is very simple. I always tell people, think about it like you have a bunch of people sitting on a sofa watching a TV, each one with a remote control in their hand. And so if one person pauses, it pauses for everybody. If one person rewinds, it rewinds for everybody. So it's synchronized among all the people viewing it, which are the people you're seeing on the right. And so they're watching a recorded class, but they can discuss it, they can pause it. We definitely saw in Coursera a very significant uplift in achievement and retention when students are collaborating and viewing a and doing a class together. In addition to that, by the way, if there was a poll or a quiz in the live class, in the recording, the recording stops and the students that are watching the recorded session do have to respond to it. So they have to be actively involved in the learning. They can't just 
stop uh, basically just watch it it stops and they have to do the test and we all appreciate and recognize the importance of the interaction between the student and the professor uh, we've built into the product a number of tools to do that we, we think that again this is an important part of pedagogy uh, to have this two-way dialogue between the professor and the student at all times and so we definitely encourage the professor to stop every few minutes and ask uh, how people are doing and this gives the professor a very clear indication of which student is where in the journey and allow students to express themselves anytime they want. This is also useful for the instructor to see an aggregate of the class. This is what you see in these uh, two thermometers to the right of the professor. The one on the left gives a professor a view of the overall uh, activity level of the students. And the one on the right is a sentiment as expressed by the students. Uh, we talked about separating out the Q&A from the chat. In Europe, you have very uh, strict privacy laws, like uh, GDPR specifically. Uh, we're very, very careful with uh, student privacy. So in a recorded class and engagement, we do not record any activity that's going on the tables. None of that gets recorded. None of the chat messages get recorded. Uh, the only thing we record are the instructor, the instructor screen share, whatever they're sharing with their students, and the Q&A as well as uh, students that raise their hand to ask a question of the professor that are viewed by the entire class, but the students can choose not to basically show their face. Uh, so again, uh, the Q&A, in addition to making it much easier for the professor to track what's interesting to students, makes it also much easier to control what's being recorded and what's not. I'll touch a bit, I mean, uh, this is one of these fields where there's different terms for different things. So we support both hybrid and high flex, uh, no matter what the definition is. So we support synchronous and asynchronous, as well as in-person students and remote students. Uh, what we're showing over here is what some people call hybrid, other people call high flex, which is that some students are in class, some students are not. The ones on the far left are the ones that are in the classroom today. The one in this grid are the ones that are remote. And we definitely facilitate interaction between the in-class students and the remote ones in many ways. One of the ways is, for example, especially in large auditorium, if it's, it's very hard for the remote students to clearly hear the in-person student. We, you, we take the fact that the students in the classroom have a handheld device or a laptop, and when they want to speak, we pick up the audio directly from the microphone in that particular student's cell phone muting everybody else. And this allows our remote students to very clearly hear the in-person student. Um, so Peter Drucker is uh, one of, in my opinion, the most uh, forward thinking uh, for his time uh, business professors. And he always said that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So not only do we do a lot of measurements, uh, but we show that in a variety of ways to the professor, both live during the class, like I saw, like I showed with those little thermometers, as well as for post-class analysis, as well as we can provide you with all the data for further analysis. Uh, we basically measure student activity. Are they sending chat messages? Are they posting questions? Are they answering other students' questions? We measure their talk time. We measure how much time they're on the podium, which means that they're addressing the whole class. Um, many different data points that are very fine in granularity. Uh, we do not do anything offensive. So we do not look at what other applications are they running on their computer. We do not do gaze tracking. We don't do anything intrusive. We're just tracking basically what they're doing on the platform. Uh, we also provide, uh, and this again is very important for collaborative purposes, uh, a talk time measurement tool that we're working on, that when students are being asked to work on an assignment, uh, this little blue dot, the closer it is to the student, it shows that they've uh, spoken more time. And this is a way for our students to self-regulate and make sure that for inclusion, everybody has uh, the opportunity to speak 
when they're working on a problem jointly. Uh, down the road, we will basically uh, also prompt instructors, uh, just give them little alerts to tell them what's going on in the classroom. Um, uh, this, by the way, is uh, another important thing that is a very important pedagogical tool that we think is important, which is many times when a professor asks a question, you have a few students whose hands fly up and this, the professor takes one of these people uh, and does not give opportunity for other students to raise their hand, we're gonna put in a little timer that basically allows other students to think about the question and raise their hand so the professor can pick the not always the same students that are fast with the answer. And so in the next couple of slides, I'm going to go into more of a futuristic uh, view of the world. And candidly, I'm going to be sprinkling some uh, machine learning uh, fairy dust, which I'm always skeptical about, but uh, <laughs> Um, I don't know how much you know about Daphne, but she's definitely one of the foremost experts in the world in uh, machine learning. And I shamelessly stole those slides from her deck, which she gave to a, a group of uh, 10,000 machine learning experts. So uh, I'm sure they're correct. And so, like I said, we are basically collecting a lot of data on students. And you all have a lot of data on student outcomes. You know how well they're doing in tests, you know how well they're doing in things that are not. Uh, I mean, today universities are collecting more and more data on the student. And what we add to this collection of data is this very granular real time data point in time stream that can be used for very fast interventions. Now, professors today are obviously very skilled at having insights, especially in small classes on individual students and on the class as a whole. Uh, but it's pretty hard to do it on large student populations in a classroom. And it's very hard to pull the emotion out of which educational approach works best. So a professor in a small seminar with 20 students can keep track of the students and figure out what's working or not, but it's very hard to do this at scale. And again, uh, we're very aware that doing experiments is uh, fraught with uh, legal and other issues. But we do believe that the time has come for people to try different ways of instruction and see what creates the most effective ways to teach. So a lot of what I'm describing here can be done without any machine learning, or artificial intelligence technologies to some extent. And I want to be crystal clear, we are not advocating replacing professors with robots. It's completely impossible. It's not going to happen. We don't advocate that. We just recommend adding to the tool set of the professor over time um, machine learning capabilities. And I'll give an example from work Daphne did many years ago on, um, on uh, babies that were born at the very, very uh, premature stage at high risk. And she and her students built a little piece of software that used the regular measurements that doctors take of these uh, premature babies, very, very uh, basic stuff like a heart rate, uh, respiratory rate, and so on. And it turned out that using machine learning techniques, they could predict much more accurately than experienced doctors, the chances of this uh, little baby to survive in a regional hospital. And what that's used for is to accurately predict and give the doctor a tool that was much more predictive than the doctor had of when it came time to ask a plane to come over and take a little baby from a regional hospital to a major hospital with more equipment uh, to keep that baby alive. So again, this is just an add-on tool to what um, professors we, we, we think can give them help. And so I'll begin with personalization. All of you are benefiting today from machine learning and uh, personalization. Uh, if you're watching Netflix, the movies that are being recommended to you are being uh, recommended using machine learning techniques. When you buy on Amazon, Amazon is using machine learning techniques to recommend things for you to buy. By the way, when you're driving a car today and it alerts you before a collision, that's all machine learning. So again, 
it doesn't replace the driver. Netflix does not pick for you what to watch and Amazon does not force you to buy anything, but it makes it easier and in the case of driving safer. So how do we recommend doing it? And where does machine learning in the future come into play? Um, again, computers are tireless and quite accurate and unemotional. So they can interpret uh, down the road video and audio in a very objective way. Uh, they can also very clearly analyze uh, click streams. Work has been done on click stream analysis uh, for the past almost uh, 25 years. And sentiment analysis is becoming better and better and better and better. And again, using the combination of all of these, um, that will be creating tools for professors to have a much more accurate sense of what's working and what's not, as well as uh, real-time information. And so using all that, you can start predicting uh, student success and more importantly, identifying students at risk, as well as, again, uh, suggesting what type of interventions can work. For example, um, using techniques that have been around for quite a time and have been proven to be useful, like collaborative filtering, you can say, well, for this particular type of student, we recommend that they watch a video. But for this other student, for them to progress in the class, they're better off being paired with a peer instructor who will work with them and help them get over the hump so they can continue progressing in the classroom. And again, uh, computers, believe it or not, are getting better at planning and interpreting the results of experiments and analyzing what actually drove the outcomes. Again, unemotional, they'll just say, well, this seems to have worked. And lastly, and again, this is really future, um, one of the popular machine learning techniques is called uh, reinforcement learning. This is a computer learning, not humans learning, just to be clear. Uh, what uh, reinforcement learning uh, does is basically the computer tries different things, uh, trying to optimize, in this particular case, student success. And it's trying out these different strategies. And when a strategy seems to work, it reinforces that strategy. It basically gives that particular strategy a little higher grade, or as uh, they like to say, it, it's rewarded. And if the strategy is not working too well, then it basically is penalized that particular strategy and they try it less times. And again, you do it time and time and time again over a statistically significant number of individuals, you will find what works uh, more and more accurately for given types of students. So to recap, we fundamentally believe, and many people we talk to throughout the world uh, believe the same, that people are thinking differently today than they do about education than they did a couple of years ago. And both, uh, not just the students, but also instructors uh, we met with a friend of ours who is a very famous professor in Berkeley, and he said quietly, I kind of like teaching from home. Uh, just like most people like working from home, so do professors in many cases. And uh, I think it's obvious that virtual learning is much more broadly accepted. Um, there are many challenges that we discussed in all these areas that are listed on the slide. I will not read the slide, but uh, new technologies and new pedagogies are required in order to really benefit from this new way of teaching. The Virtual classroom can be and should be designed for one purpose, which is to ensure student success, uh, as well as to provide all these other benefits that are listed here. And lastly, uh, the outcomes, as we said, are improved by various types of techniques, either done uh, manually or down the road being done with assist from advanced uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques. So that is my last uh, slide, and I'll be very happy to have a conversation, hopefully an engaging one. Thank you very much, Dan. So a big round of virtual applause for, for Dan, please. Uh, now it's time for uh, the discussion, so you can raise your hand uh, if you have some questions. In the meanwhile, uh, I would like to say that, that you have touched many of the topics uh, 
that uh, we have been discussing in this conference for several days, uh, collaborative learning, active learning, engagement, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is not definitely not new, but the, the application to education has been a, a trend for the last few years, at least to, to, to the best of, of, of my knowledge. And you mentioned something that is important, that is the cognitive load of the teacher. So now, now the teacher needs to go uh, or, or use several tools. So it goes from Zoom to Teams to um, Google Meet, now Engagely. Um, you need to take control of the class, um, try to apply your collaborative learning activities and so on. And of course, don't, don't forget about the content, the specific content of the course. Um, and on the other side, you have some, um, let's say, um, help or support from some, uh, let's say, um, algorithms that are calculated through machine learning and artificial intelligence, maybe, um, to provide these visualizations, these insights to the teacher. So you need to control all this. And, and the question is, where is the perfect balance so that you don't, do not overwhelm the teacher with everything and the teacher does not lose the control on the classroom. And maybe this comes from a discussion that we had yesterday also on the self-driving cars. So are you still having your hands on the wheel uh, or do you want to relax because this is your fourth class uh, in a row? This morning you were completely exhausted and you want the car just to drive alone. Yeah, we, we tried that with our Tesla once and almost got killed, so we never tried it again. Uh, but uh, one more way that we think it can be done is with uh, teaching assistants. And we really have seen that if you have the professor kind of focus on the class and have a good teaching assistant that helps with the technology, helps with keeping an eye, like Carlos, you were saying, keeping an eye on the students and who's in trouble. Um, and it's the first time we've seen that you can actually use TAs in a live classroom. So at Stanford, both Daphne and Serge would get, you know, at least a dozen TAs for their classes because they're large classrooms. And Stanford has this formula that for every N students, you get a TA. So in a live classroom, what would happen is the students would be sitting in the back row. The TA is not doing anything. But now you can actually deploy these TAs and assign them roles. And, you know, one can drive the technology. So the professor just has to talk and let somebody else deal with uh, the technology. Um, another can go between tables and help students out. So in addition to the technology, there's also room for a plain old fashioned human intervention. I was talking to a professor at Harvard uh, Business School a few days ago. So she told me that in uh, Harvard Business School, you have scribes sitting in the back of the room that literally measure the time every student speaks to the class because participation is a key part of the grade there. And so you have these people that basically are doing what we do automatically in the software, which is measure how much time people are on the podium. And so you can free the, those people from doing a very manual work, which I'm not sure they do all that accurately, saying that this student started talking at this minute and stopped talking at that minute, let the computer do that, and maybe they can help some other place. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tina. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Dana Vida. I was uh, wondering, and I want to go back to one of the original pictures of your presentation, which was the picture of the Zoom room where everyone turned off his camera and was coming up with all excuses not to turn on their camera. So in the end, if people are now using Engagely, are students more tempted to turn on their camera? Do you think they should do it? Or is a teacher not missing the students' faces anymore because he's getting all this information on how engaged they are and it's getting other, other metrics? So do you have any feedback uh, from how much the camera was used? And can you share your vision on what's the importance of, op importance of having these uh, camera views of students in the future? It's a great question. Thank you very much for the question. So left to their own devices, students will leave their camera off because like I said, they're probably doing something else. Um, so we try to encourage them in a variety of ways to turn on the camera to, to avoid like, you know, people who claim, well, we're shy and we don't, uh, we, we, we don't want our friends to see us. We have a mode that we've put in where only the professor can see the students, but not other students. 
and they tend to be more comfortable with uh, the professor seeing them, but not their friends seeing them. Uh, so that's one thing we put in. The other thing we've seen is once they get into these uh, table groups, then, and they have to collaborate, they're much more likely, like you see over here, to turn on the camera, because especially uh, there are social pressures. If one turn on the camera, then the friends turn on the camera, and then they see, oh, we can talk to our friends also, not just when we're working together on a project, but throughout the, the class. So in some universities, actually in many universities, we've definitely seen the trend of the camera usage going more and more up and students are more open to keeping the cameras on. With respect to the other point you raised, do you even need the camera on? At the end of the day, professors are human beings and it's easier for them to read body language than to read little thermostats that go up and down. And so they feel, and especially somebody who's been teaching for a number of years, they want to see their students. They want to see the body language. They want to see the facial expression. So we definitely recommend it, but you know, if they can't do that, it's like flying in the dark, right? At least use your instruments. And so we show the thermometers, we show like that thumbs up, thumbs down. And in that case, we do recommend if you're flying in the dark to ask students on a pretty frequent basis how you're doing and so on, uh, to at least get some telemetry of what's happening in the classroom. Thank Great. you. Let's see, we have some more questions. Um, in the meanwhile, I would like to ask you, um, so you, you, you have shown us uh, several types of visualizations, this thermostat that goes up and down and, 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 and so you see the green or you see the, the, the red and so on. Um, there is some discussion here in, the, in this community about what is called the explainable learning analytics and explainable artificial intelligence. No? So how do I trust this green or red if sometimes I don't know how this is calculated underneath? No? Uh, so what is your opinion about that? Sh should teachers know more of uh, how this is done and then ah, okay then I can rely on this calculation or not or some of them do not want to uh, dedicate more time to think about it just want the green the green or the red hello thank you very much for the question Carlos so we uh, totally expose our calculation and leave it up to the instructor we have a little mixer that takes in all these data points like uh, chat messages sent questions answered questions posted and allow the professor to weight the importance of all these to create one data point per student. Uh, SARS are very easy to explain because we're not using any machine learning. Explaining machine learning algorithms is super complicated. I mean, uh, in the sense that if you have a multi-layer neural network, it's very hard to know what exactly they do. And so I fully agree with you, Carlos, at that point, I mean, I don't think it is explainable, right? I mean, basically the neural networks calculates automatically all the different weights and good luck trying to figure out what it does. So at this point in time, it's basically just a very simple weighted average of different data points per student. And we decay over time uh, the signal because if somebody was engaged five minutes ago, maybe they're not that engaged now. So I don't know if you notice, but like the green dot eventually fades out uh, because of the decay. Uh, by the way, we do the same, or we will do the same for the voting up and down of a question um, that's posed to the instructor, because if a student posed the question and a lot of students voted it up 10 minutes later, it's probably not that relevant because the class has moved on. So we decay the weight of based on time for that. So no, our, our formula is completely open. We it's super easy to understand. Uh, I definitely get the point. I always had this issue, you know, with... Um, the artificial intelligence based uh, security products that look for anomalies that, okay, how do you know what's an anomaly? Because it's very hard to explain what the artificial intelligence neural network decides is an anomaly and what's not. So I, I get the issue, not just in, it's, it's a general issue with artificial intelligence. I mean, last thing I would say on that topic, I don't know if you saw this whole thing with Tesla, that turns out that the Teslas like to drive into police cars. Did you, did you hear about that? There's been 12 accidents of Teslas driving into parked police cars. And again, there's probably some algorithm over there nobody can explain, but seems to like to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Sahum. Oh, important. Hi, Dan. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, 
as I understand it, Engagely is primarily for university students or college students in America. Uh, but do you foresee any extension into, for example, K-12 education or uh, more vocational training? And if so, with your future learning analytic uh, future, do you, do you see this, do you, do you use the same analytics, uh, different analytics, or just a different algorithm? Uh, thank you for the question. So today we're focused on universities. Um, K to 12 um, has, to your point, different dynamics, which will probably lead to different calculations. Um, we are working with a small number of more, you know, kind of, I would say, 8 to 12 than K to 12. Um, I, I think that small kids should go to school, should play in the playground, uh, that have a real benefit from uh, basically the physical interaction. There are a small number of um, distance learning uh, high school kids. And I think where maybe we'll do down the road, we thought about in the early days of the company, haven't done a lot with it, is uh, tutoring, uh, you know, test preparation and so on. Again, these are later in, uh, in the K-12 to spectrum. Uh, vocational is 100% something we're interested in. And again, the same trajectory in Coursera, I just happened to see on the Google homepage a couple of days back where on the homepage, it basically said, if you want a, uh, to improve your skills uh, for a marketable uh, job, uh, please click here and you click here, it sent you to basically Google training on Coursera. So, but again, as you know, Coursera started with universities, the same type of, I mean, adult education, in my opinion is adult education, where the, the uh, adult is a student at a, university or somebody later on doing vocational training or it's, it's, it's the same, but we're starting with universities because that is really where pedagogies get developed and refined. And then we will export that and expand it into adult learning in general. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if there is maybe a final question. Uh, if not, I would like to mention, I, I really like the, the blog, as you mentioned Coursera several times, I really like the blog where they publish some A-B testing experiments, uh, like uh, papers, like, but it was, it was in a blog, and I hope you can do something like this uh, with some of the data you collect also for, for research purposes. Yeah, no, thank you, Carlos. As you know, Andrina used to run teaching and learning at Coursera, is now running teaching and learning at Engagely. And she has a PhD in biomedical engineering. So she's very numerical and accurate in their thinking. We will definitely do it. It takes a bit of time, Carlos. Say we have to collect a lot of data. Being the US, you need to basically do IRB. I'm sure in Europe there is the same type of stuff. Doing experiments is. Uh, you know, just getting an IRB is many months of paperwork. I mean, Daphne started working on this like you know, almost a decade ago to get all the paperwork sorted out for doing these experiments, but it's the right way to go. I mean, no question about it. Okay, so it seems there are no more questions. So it's uh, five o'clock here in Central Europe. Uh, so we really thank you for your time, Dan. It was a pleasure to have you this year on Actel 2021. So a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor. I very much appreciate it. Thank you.